the last stretch we are going to talk about projections, and I think it's going to center mostly around the number one question that I know when we, when we were in Nashville that we would get, which is people came up to our booth and they'd say, oh, this is really cool. I've seen this. I love this. I love the idea of it. But let me tell you, I have this space, and it's really challenging. How do I make this work with my gear in my space? And there's like some things I'm going to talk about, about kind of how to get started and um, kind of how to tear up uh, from there. But um, I know that at the very beginning, we watched a little video trailer that we had put together, but I thought we'd watch that again, especially for the people who have joined since, just to kind of like boost us back into the world of projections and um, creating digital environments for your show. So we'll go ahead and show you a video, and then I'll start chatting about that. I mean, I love, every time I watch that, um, I love, I just love what projections can do. I mean, I really do. I love the way that they can um, just unlock the possibilities. And um, I want to talk about that a little bit for sure. Um, if you could go to the next uh, slide, Josh. Well, first of all, here's my Not the Real Sun um, slide. We actually created this for Lion King. It was actually a rising sun that came up. But I was just knowing that we were going to be stuck in this hotel <laughs> room like all day and that you guys would not have seen the real sun. So I thought, well, we'll just give you a small taste of like what the sun actually feels like through a virtual projection. Not the real thing, but it was really amazing. And it reminds me of the simplicity of things and how like we simply had that sunrise just coming up very slowly over the course of that song. But it really was magical and amazing to see. If you go to the next slide, I want to take a breath. And we've kind of touched on this several times as we've told bits of our stories. But I want to talk about a little bit of my why. First of all, that's me. And as I, as I had my, my mom send me that picture, which she was stoked about because she got to have a part in the workshop. Um, but, um, but as I look at it, he, he looks a lot like my son Jacob, you know, or I look a lot like my son Jacob. But um, there is something about having no limits. I mean, when I was a kid, kind of going back to my past and getting into movies, getting into theater, there really is something about, um, like you were talking about Amanda playing. And I would go through phases. Like I went through a Wizard of Oz phase when I was in kindergarten. And uh, I remember drawing, picture, uh, drawing a picture for my teacher. And I remember that um, like my dad was a teacher at the high school at the time. And I would hang out with him in the faculty lounge like after school. And one year, I missed The Wizard of Oz on television, because, and this is really dating me, but they would play The Wizard of Oz on television once a year. And you had to tape it. And this was before people bought movies. You taped movies onto VHS, and you could tape, Eileen remembers, you can tape three movies onto a VHS tape. And a lot of times, you had to fast forward to the point where you get to the movie, and you'd watch it. I remember we taped The Wizard of Oz off of television, and I was just desperate to watch it because I was so stoked that I, had not, I hadn't gotten a chance to watch it that night. So I was just bugging my dad after school. And he was like, OK, you can watch it, but I guess you have to get some exercise too. So he's like, we have this little trampoline like, that we have like, in our living room. He's like, as long as you're jumping on the trampoline, he's like, you can watch it. So there was like little Mitch in there like jumping, knowing that if I stopped jumping, 
the Wizard of Oz was going to go off. And I just often even wonder these things about us as kids, like the people that are watching from a distance, you know, when you're playing, when you're doing these things, like what this must have looked like to our neighbors, you know. And uh, so I went through a Wizard of Oz phase. Then I went through a Mary Poppins phase, which was big for me. I'm really convinced that I both wanted Mary Poppins to be my mom. And I think I also, she was kind of like my first crush, too. Because I remember, like, we got this local paper, and this picture of Julie Andrews showed up in the paper. And I cut the picture out and brought it to school with me. And then I was like, well, I'm going to lunch. So I put the picture into my lunchbox. And I still remember it like it was yesterday. My friend Jeremy Miller, standing behind me in line, he goes, she's in your lunchbox? He goes, you're not going to eat her for lunch, are you? But this was like, I mean, that is when you're a kid, you're free, and you play. And I made plays, and I did things. We didn't have a video uh, camera at the time, so I would make little audio dramas on my tape recorder. But then I've told, I've told Amanda this, and I've told different people, like, something can happen over time. It's like you talked about the people that can maybe, like, discourage you in a certain way. For me, it wasn't even, I can't even remember people directly discouraging me, but sometimes just the course of time or insecurity or pressure, it can start to chip away at this dream. And when I was teaching school, I would notice that too. It's like schools, administration, like budgets, parents, like all this stuff over time, it can kind of start to wear on us to the point where that initial spark, and a lot of people have talked about the, fl you talked about the flint and the spark. It's like the spark can start to fizzle and can start to die out. And I think that that is some of our hearts even behind doing a workshop, which is it's so important in the community to come together and to not just teach each other information, but also encourage and share and empower. And I really feel like my connection, my friendship with Amanda and with Kylie and with Jared has really helped me. And I wanted to go to the next slide because this is where, for me, um, projections kind of came onto my radar. So hang with me for a second, one more second of storytelling, because for me, it, was, it literally looked like this. I had spent time as a kid loving magic, loving movies, loving the theater shows that I went to, and then I got into graphic design, I got into illustration, and one day I got a call from my friend Amanda, and she said, so we're in Selma, and we're making this show Footloose, and it's our first show. Do you think you could make us a poster? And I thought, well, I've never made a theater poster before. Sure. And so I had a friend, and we went downstairs. And this is as adults, of course. Went downstairs in, like, the basement, got a, got a, a camera, like, put on some jams from Footloose. And he just started to dance and go with it. And we took these pictures, and we turned the picture into a silhouette, which then became the Footloose poster. And it's kind of like you're talking about with YouTube. It's the figuring out of things, like, as you go along. Anyone that tells you that that's not the way it happens, they're just bold-faced lying because that's how we all learn and how we figure out how to do things. But it went very quickly from posters then into projections, which two shows later, Amanda calls me and says, and we've told part of the story already, she says, you know, we got this big 40-foot space, and I guess, like, it could just be a space, or we could put something up there. Do you think you could paint something digitally on the computer that we could put up in that space? So I said, sure, well, you know, I didn't know anything about projections or what had been done, and we did it, and it wasn't long after that that we started to really see the possibilities in it. And it's almost like full circle with The Wizard of Oz, because then we went up to this little dinner theater and saw a production of The Wizard of Oz, and I remember it so vividly because, for me, it was like the rekindling of that spark that I talked about, because I came out of that show, and it wasn't even the show or it was, it was like the whole experience of it, and it wasn't even what all of what we ended up doing, but it was the idea of getting back into that place of dreaming again, of what could be possible. And like, it's like, well, projection could do this, and you could fly, and the witch could just like, she could appear on the top of the house like in a burst of flame, and we could do this, we actually could do this. And this was before it was really being done a lot. In fact, you know, I saw a New York Times article a few weeks ago that said, projections have been this kind of accent, or they're dropped in here or there, but they are becoming more and more the fabric of shows. As technology improves, as things get better, things become simpler, things become cheaper, and now the equipment that's necessary to do it, it's kind of like the old Hollywood system, right? The equipment that um, was required before, like with big cameras and studios and all that stuff, it's now gone away. And like, Ethan, you've got your phone. It's like, that's a movie studio now. 
And the same is true in the world of projections. If you can get some images, and you can get a computer, and you can get your hands on a projector, then you can start doing this. And that's one of the things that inspires me the most about it. It's not just the art, but the fact that it levels the playing field again. We have a, a lady out in California who bought some of our projections for Annie the Musical, and she called me right after, and she goes, you're not going to believe this. She said, I had parents coming up to me after my show with my little theater group that said, we've been to Broadway shows that did not look that good. I'm like, wow, this is beyond just a little, this is a movement, and it's only going to grow and increase. So that's my little pre-plug, I guess, for like what we're doing, but I want to go ahead and advance on because um, projection at its core, who here has done projection before, tried projection, knows about projection like a little bit? Yeah, and we talked to some people in Nashville who were like, oh, I tried it and I crashed and burned. And like sometimes that's just enough to discourage you from trying it again. And I've been telling um, these guys, like I think 95% of what I feel like we do is like try to just encourage, like to get started and to try and to take that first step. Because once you do that, you get an instant result when you see it and you go, oh, it could be brighter, but it's either a black curtain or it's this, and then how do we make it better with the next show? And I, there's a few of these slides with the what is digital projection that just kind of show that's from Anastasia, Newsies. Like, I mean, you're seeing more application. I think that's Finding Neverland. Yeah. Um, but you're seeing it more incorporated in. And what's beautiful about it is it, it can really mirror and follow and set a course for the scenic design in the show. Um, because that's what's beautiful about scenic design is scenic design does not have to be one thing. And you saw in our little trailer, there's a whole range. There's completely photorealistic stuff, which might be used for like a gritty orphanage for Annie the Musical. But then you've got a range all the way going into the whimsical. And then when we did Honk Jr., like we had this really cartoonish stuff that we wanted to do. But then we wanted to do something, and you kind of got a taste of it, something kind of 3D where we'd set it up like a diorama in the computer, and you could actually feel the depth. And that's what I love about it too, is that it starts to extend the stage and create this environment that transports the audience, but then also, like you were saying, transports the kids you know, to a whole other place so they really feel like they're in that world that they're performing in. So go ahead. So, yes, I've been speaking to this, but like if you walk out of here with like nothing else that I've talked about, it's like know that you can get started. And I know that some of that will start here and I'm gonna try to give you some of the meat and some of the like fundamental things, but I know that there will also be specific questions about things like how do I get this going? But I want you to know that like if you want to get started, there are ways to beg, borrow, steal, gather, find things to be able to make this work in your space. And I don't care what your space looks like because like Jared was talking about, there are all kinds of crazy spaces that we've had to find a way to make it work. And so some of that is the real creativity. And that was the magic of the room. Like when we were teaching the workshop in Nashville, people were raising their hand. They're like, oh, I, I bought this photo frame on Amazon and I just stretched some plastic around it. And then we had a rear projection screen. It's like, wow, you start to see the community and the sharing. Um, can really empower you to do some new things. So go ahead. Yeah, it's easy if you try. John Lennon said that. So the why, I mean, Amanda likes to call this point and shoot. It's like the point and shoot camera. It's like, it's very direct, you know? And, you know, we've talked about how it can be magical. It's a way to bring professional quality stuff into your show. It's a great way to bring, like, really high quality, like, imagery. Um, like, and you can have your students create it or, you know, like that's what we do is we create some of that stuff. Um, you can have a student, you can get a student from the tech end involved in this. You can have a whole designated role of a student sitting back in the tech booth or sometimes we've had them sitting behind the screen for rear projection and they both are running it and they're also like the guard. They, they guard the projector that's sitting back there. We did a version of Annie the Musical where we actually had to have kids come behind the screen backstage so we had like a stepladder over the projector and they were like, helping kids, you know, like over the stepladder to keep them from kicking the projector as they were going across. But it, what I love about it is there's great learning that happens in it too. So you have your lighting technicians, you have your sound technicians who are your kids, or, or if you're doing community theater, it could be different volunteers and stuff. But then you have this other role that opens up, which is building the slideshow or building this series of images that like can transport people from scene to scene really seamlessly. 
And that's one of the things we talk about. I mean, obviously, with fabric drops, you've got something that is pretty stagnant, and still you can do some lighting effects. But now you can have, and Robert, you were talking about Christmas Carol, right? It's like with Christmas Carol, now all of a sudden, quite simply, you can have snow falling in the background. Or you can really like create a mood or create an atmosphere. And that's some of the application that we've seen is that in theater, it doesn't have to be so literal. So like we did, we did a production, I did a production recently of Swan Lake. And um, the director, because we were doing projections, was like, well, with lighting, with the traditional drop, what I would typically do is cast different lights onto the screen. He goes, but with projection, obviously, I can't cast light on it. So what we did is we painted one image of the lake, which we could have the lake moving and all of that. But then we like, I looked at some of the traditional drops that they've done in ballet for Swan Lake. And there were some that had really aggressive reds and purples and things like that. And so then we would just like do a simple cross fade just in PowerPoint or Keynote. And he was saying that the audience would just gush because it would look like the moon just lit up, you know, in different scenes. And that's the beauty of it too is like things happen that you don't anticipate. Like as you start to play with images and you start to like put them up there. Smooth transitions. Um, Jared testified or talked already about the whole idea of like 37 hours for what, a three minute song? Um, and I think we've either experienced it personally where we're trying to paint things last minute. I've seen many and many art department that is like sort of sequestered at the last moment. Please save our show. Like we were supposed to be painting things, but we haven't been painting things. And could you come in? And like then you have those like late night troops that are just like working, working, working. And as a theater director, I mean, that becomes just one more thing. So I think one of the things projections can do is it can take some of that pressure off and it can alleviate that to really allow you to focus on the things that you're passionate about and that you want to focus on. For some directors, it's like the actors or it is the investment in the kids, and I think this can give you that opportunity. And then, you know, it's the future. It's where things are going. And you can get started, and then you can kind of level up. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we kind of go. So I don't care what level you ever do this at, at the elementary school level or at the Broadway level, that is all you will ever need. Now. There are big, bad, expensive versions of certain things, but really it comes down to that. You have to have some kind of a projector like that is going to cast the image. And this can seem kind of simple or, or fundamental, but I point this out so specifically because I think it's really good to see that that's the only thing you have to get over to start with this. You know, typically a school projector is may or may not be bright enough. So we say like, if you're working with like a mid-sized room, like an auditorium or something, it's good to have like a brighter projector. And if you're in the world of projectors and brightness, they call that lumens. And so you want to have a projector that's ideally over about 5,000 lumens to be able to kind of compete with some of your other ambient lighting that you've got. You just have to have some projection surface. You've got a wall, a screen, Bed sheets. What are, are there some other examples? Oh, my favorite is uh, construction plastic. Yeah. It's like white plastic sheeting that goes under construction projects typically at Home Depot. Super cheap. It's one of the nicest and actually very professional screen surfaces I've ever used. You can rear project it. You can front project it. It gets you a really crisp thing. But it's I can totally do it on my budget, and I can just have somebody build it, build a screen, and stretch the plastic over it. If you want to get fancy, you take a blow dryer and stretch out, heat out the wrinkles, and you get a really incredible picture for nothing. For no and it gives, cost at it all. gives um, that volunteer, that construction-minded volunteer, because there are those people. And I sat at a table with Josh, who's in the back, and another volunteer who was very construction-minded and just said, hey, here's kind of what we need. And I just sat there for 15 minutes, and they just went back and forth, back and forth, and I was kind of just like listening. But it like engages their creativity. So they may be like building things, but their creativity comes out. It's like we went from one show using the construction plastic to the next one, and all of a sudden they're like, you know what? We could get the screen tighter if we just built a bicycle ratchet system on it. And they figured some way to like actually tighten it up tighter so that it could look even better on Charlotte's Web than it looked on Annie the Musical. So it's amazing too, like when you enlist those kinds of people to help. And it sounds simple to say, but I can't tell you how many teachers, directors, um, semi-professional even, that you get on the phone and they don't even think of that whole idea of like, oh wow, I could activate this piece or this part to help build that thing for me. And then there you go, I've crossed that off my list of things to do and we're halfway there as far as projections go. Yeah, 
way to um, get parents involved is to even send out a, like, hey, I'm looking for someone to help me build this or to design this, you know, it's a great way to kind of even get to know your students and their families more. And to that point, you're saying like the, it engages them, but people also love that. Like I, I like to cook and when people are like, oh, we're doing a big thing, my mind is like food. How do I feed the people? And there's other people who wouldn't think of themselves as theater people but they think of themselves as Home Depot people. And like you said, you, you get the conversation going, this, this, and that, and then you walk in the room the next day and they've got like a 25-foot ladder and they built a little platform to put the projector on. I've seen people like with a rope pulley system that's like, I would never have thought of that in my life. And I don't have to. I don't have to be the one to think of it. There are other people who do that and they love to do it. They love thinking of it. It's like the challenge that they love to do, you know? And I know that the third thing that was on that previous slide was just the tech piece, which literally can be as simple as a laptop, which in the teaching world, I know that there are laptops floating around um, with PowerPoint, with Keynote. And you know there are fancier versions. You can get into ImageQ and QLab and all these different things. But I will tell you, you can do magical things with Keynote and with PowerPoint. And what's great about those tools, too, is that there's not a really steep learning curve, so your students can, like, basically build your presentation from that. They can put simple cross dissolves in between. We had these beautiful, seamless, like, blackouts from, like, one scene to another. And then maybe we'll show it if we have time here at the end, but, like, when we did Annie, like, with a local group, um, they had, like, a daytime orphanage. And the beauty of digital images is then you can, like, recreate that as a nighttime image. And without any animation, you can go from like a daytime orphanage and a smooth, beautiful transition to night and then back again. And it's literally just rearranging slides in your presentation. So it's, it's magical. I'm still struck by the magic. I mean, we're sitting around before these workshops in the middle and we just keep dreaming about like the things that you can do. And I love that about it. I love that about it, that it like takes some of those shackles off. As a, as a teacher, as a director, you can go, First of all, ignore the limitations. What would I love to see? What would my kids love to see? Like what comes out of the story? Like what way could we do it that's never been done before? And it just like gives you um, a passageway or a way to actually be able to express those ideas, you know, in a new way. So yes, the next slide. And um, so I, I've often thought, well, is this too simple? But I talk to technical directors, and I'm talking at the very highest level, people that think in the world of physics and know all of the algorithms and angles. And let me just give you a word of warning. Like, if you're spending your time online researching these things, like, um, you've probably wandered into the woods too far when it comes to the technical stuff. You don't have to know that. The tech directors have told me, just tell anyone this. Just find the brightest projector that you can. Rent it. Buy it. I mean, there's this one right here is actually a, we used it for a rear throw projector, and it worked in a small space beautifully. We used it for Charlotte's Web. Like, you can actually, like, buy that online, I think, for what, like $600? Which, I mean, I'm talking when it comes to projector equipment. And I'm talking to teachers, too, that come out of conferences where they're sometimes convinced that it's going to take $10,000 to make this work. And what does that do immediately when you hear that? It's like, oh. Never mind. Yeah, I'm not doing that, or I could never do that. And it just cancels it out in your mind. And so then we love when people like that wander up like, no, 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 no. Whether you buy anything from us or not, we don't care. Just like know that you can do this. Know that this is a possibility. Know that you can jump in. And you can try this, and every show you're going to learn something. In fact, one of the best things about just getting the brightest projector you can is that you just go, once again, sounds simple, you get any image. You put it on your computer. You plug it into your projector. You put it up on the screen, you turn up your lights, and you just look. And sometimes that's the best learning that you can do. Because I've talked to people who it's like, it can be tough because you're just like mulling over, should we do this, should we do this? And um, there's nothing like just getting that instant feedback. And with each show that we've done, we're like, oh, we could do it a little bit better this way, or here's how we could block out a little bit more of the light so that it could shine up brighter. Or even something that I haven't mentioned is the, the, the timing of it is magical. Like we discovered with Charlotte's Web, when we did that, we realized, you know what? It's not just about the lighting and the balance between the lighting and your projector light, because your projector light's just like another light, right? It's also when we bring that up. 
So like a movie scene, like an establishing shot, if we go from black and we bring the projection up first and then you bring up your lights, I'm telling you every time the audience would just gasp because they could feel that transporting of, of location through that. And then in some scenes too, we would like spotlight it specifically because we knew that we really wanted the projection to sing in that scene. We wanted a certain mood to get across. But then also we would do the reverse. In some scenes it's like a traditional drop is gonna wash out a little bit with lights too. So we're like in this scene, it's more about like what's happening center stage. And so we'll just let the projected screen wash out a little bit. So I say all that to say, don't get drowned in the technical stuff because there's either people that know it that can help you um, or like you can just kind of get started and kind of figure out as you go. Even I know for me in the schools that I worked at, it's like $600 for a projector. Whoa, like I don't have any budget. But I think there are ways too that you can work with other people in the school or like the, the librarian or like there, I would have to be creative and go to other people or say, hey, activities people at this college or hey, you know, football team at the high school, <laughs> can we go in and buy this together? And you could use it, you know, like, you can use it to project games or whatever for the players. I mean, I had to get really creative. But there are ways, ways to do it, ways to make it work. And then if you think about the investment of a $600 projector that you're going to use, you know, yeah, every year, every year three times and it, it can really work, but I know that money can be a real issue, but there are ways to make it work. And I think what I have coming up next, it's so funny, I've sort of nicknamed this my walk through the woods video, but, but I wanna show you guys a video because, and I'm just kind of touching on things. It probably feels like that, okay, touching on this, touching on this, but we can always go deeper either in the time after or like in some of the Q and A time, um, which would be really valuable. Um, but I do want to take, it's almost like a short break to show this video because I have gotten questions before, some feedback after like, gosh, we'd love to know about the process just a little bit of like making these things because digital imagery doesn't just sort of magically appear from nowhere. And so it's like to even see a little bit of the connection of how like we can start literally with like pens and pencils and then like go to something that you can use in a show. So I just kind of wanted to show this real quick. I've always loved movies, I've always loved film, and so it just seems so obvious that we would try to take some of those techniques, whether it's things that move, but then also ways of using dramatic color, ways of using the lighting, ways of telling a story in a different way, and scenic design is just so wide open. Scenic projections, there is a process to creating them. We look at the script, we read through it, we get a sense of the story. From there, we start with research, and when I do research, I'm really looking at anything and everything that I can find. I'm going to the library and I'm flipping through books. Um, I watch movies, I look at scenes, I look at good cinematography. I'm really trying to look inside the world of theater, but then also really trying to look outside of what, what has been done before. We really start with pencils and pens and paper, very basic materials, and we're sketching ideas. Um, we're coming up with different compositions, we're coming up with different color options, we're coming up with different looks. We're really exploring anything and everything that feels like it belongs in the world of that story. From those concept drawings, then we bring those drawings into the computer. From those drawings, we do a lot of paintings. And we'll do lots and lots of versions of that painting until we get to the finished projection. A little taste of the process and um, when I talk about painting we're painting in Photoshop which actually is a program that's um, pretty accessible in school so if you have kids that are interested in learning that um, you know uh, they should be able to get access to some of that software um, to take the things that are happening on paper and translate those um, so real quick I want to this is some of the meat of it and, and I am going to kind of glaze over some of this pretty quickly still because I really want to know what the specific questions that you have are so there's a couple different ways you can do projection. Um, 
One is front projection. And um, a couple tips real quick about front projection. Um, a lot of people ask, first question out of their mouth is, okay, shadows. How do I keep my kids' shadows off of the screen? Well, there's some things you can do with staging. You can try to have your kids downstage or just do different things like that. But ideally, getting your projector up high, and that can mean mounting it to a light bar, hanging it. There's various ways we kind of talked about, like there are people, engage them, that can kind of help you with that sort of thing. Um, in front projection, you do want to try to get, if you can, it as close to the screen as possible. And like this projector, for example, I don't know, has anyone here ever heard of short throw projectors? Great, I get to tell you. So short throw projectors, it's a projector. It is a normal projector, but they have all these lenses. Some projectors you can buy, you can actually change lenses out, which is really cool. So look for that if you're like in the market to go grab your principal and say we're going to buy a new projector. Um, but uh, a short throw projector is cool because it has a lens, a special lens on it, and it's like a fisheye lens. So this projector can literally sit on the floor. It projects up, and if you're only eight feet back from the screen, and this is the magic of the fisheye lens, if you're only eight feet back, it will project a 20-foot wide image. And those projectors are just getting better and better. In fact, there will come a point, I don't know if it will be five years, where you will literally have no throw distance. There will be a way that you'll have a screen that literally folds down, and, like, and then the image will just be vivid and vi vibrant on that. In fact, we're seeing more with like not actual projection, but even just like LED screens. Like if you go to a football game and you see like the big jumbotrons that like can be bright as bright can be like in the middle of daylight. Um, that's kind of where some of this is going. But I think the, the note to have there, which is like even though this has been around a while, this is still very brand new, and this is where things are going. This is the future of scenic design, and it's not going to be limited to just like one projection right behind like the kids. It's like you're going to be able to project on flats, and you can see in Broadway some of the application. They're using it not just for a single screen, but they're using it on elements of the stage that move, or they have like all these different applications. So like looking for what they're doing out there can also like give you ideas about how to incorporate it into your program. Like I'm working with a, a high school right now on Pride and Prejudice, and they're doing two Victorian windows as a part of their set. And so I'm creating a projection that's like actually just a typical standard wide projection, but then we're taking vertical slices out of it, and we're just going to put that into PowerPoint or Keynote, and then they're going to have like two windows that they can look out of that will be, you know, um, the scenery, and we're going to have like you know, water fountains that splash and birds that fly by, and just some of those touches that can start to bring it to life. Not upstage the story, but it can like sort of give it a little bit more life. And that's some of what we try to work on too, is like making sure that it's subtle enough that it doesn't upstage, but then also like can really sing too. So the next form of projection, of course, is rear projection. And that's what we use this one for, which is basically you have your projector as far back as you can against the back wall and then you float some sort of a screen forward. We've had volunteers who have built wooden frames like to do that. You can literally hang something with weights. You can use your psych if you can move like something forward. The idea is having a screen that has a little bit of transparency to it. And I'm talking like almost like frosted shower curtains, which I say because people have used frosted shower curtains that they bought from yes, Walmart they and stitched them together. Um, and, uh, and it works. You may have some seams, but here's the thing. Your audience is not sitting right next to the projection. They are sitting in the audience. So they're far enough back that even some seams, it's like we can kind of over-obsess, we artists, about like the pristine, sharp digital quality of everything. But then like the audience looks at that and like they're transported. And that's the beauty of it. It's, it's only going to get better. It's only going to get better. So um, notes about rear projection. We've talked about the brightness of the image. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. You have to have a little backstage depth to work with, too. That's one thing that you do have to consider. It's like rear projection is probably a good candidate for those that have a little bit of stage depth to work with. So um, you will be giving up six feet, whatever it is, to be able to put the projector back there. We've worked with some stages where that's been the case, where we've had enough of an extension in front. We're like, OK, this is worth it. And the buy-in was with Amanda, right? I'm like, OK. We think we're going to do rear projection on this one. Like, what do you think? And she goes, I can give up six feet for that magic. Like, she just, like, total buy-in there. So you do. It's like you have to have a little bit of a progressive, like, I want to try this. Like, I'm going to, like, dive in and, and give this a shot to make it work. I've kind of already referred, and I'm kind of closing into the end here. I've referred to some of the creative tips. Um, 
Obviously, storytelling first. Yes, you're dealing with something technical, but the solutions are infinite. I worked with a middle school teacher. We have some middle school teachers here today, but like where she was like, okay, my stage is completely out, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to set up the sides of my stage as this expansive digital canvas. And I'm going to like actually have Shrek the musical, like on the musical on Broadway of Shrek, they are like, there's like this little rotating thing for the travel song that goes around and around. And they're just like kind of walking on this track or whatever. But she's like, I want an animated panorama that moves behind them so they can just walk in place. But she goes, I can't have it on stage, but could we just do it next to the stage? And she started thinking out of bounds. It's like, it really is like theater in the round. And that's where you have to like kind of put your mindset to, which is, how can I use this maybe outside of even some traditional ways that I would think it could be used? It's way beyond what you could even do. I mean, you could never hang a traditional fabric drop like, you know, over the audience or like off to the side like the way that you would with this, but this can give you some ability to think creatively that way too. I talked about timing. Stacking projectors. When you stack two projectors, it doubles your brightness. It's magical, it works. Now I will give you a note. It has to be the same kind of projector. But you can give this to a student, and this has been done, where they figure out how to stack them right on top of each other, and you have to get the images lined up. But that can be something you mark off your list. And you can have two 2500 lumen, which are kind of like typical school projectors, projectors combined together, and now you've got your 5000 lumens to make it work. So once again, thinking kind of outside of bounds a little bit. Um, we've seen people use a mirror. When you use a mirror, it's like a short throw projector. It like makes your image twice as big. And I've been surprised. Like I talked to a high school director who had no experience, watched YouTube videos, and there are YouTube videos where they show you how to bounce your image off of a mirror. And he did it for Les Mis. He said it worked amazing. And he just like, and this was even more old school. This was probably five, 10 years ago. He was like trying this. So be creative in that way too. Um, and then I would say like giving yourself time to play with it, not just showing up at Tech Week and going, ooh, hope it works, but like but giving yourself even a little bit of time to just go into your auditorium or into your stage space, turn on the projector, play with it, giving your students a, a chance to get used to like the movement of them through the scenes can be really good. And then the last thing is like just growing it with each show. So we talked about the three things, right? You need a projector, you need a screen or projected surface, and then you need the tech. The great thing is, once you get that big piece of the projector out of the way, think about it. Now you've got no longer $500 a week for one drop for every show, which is out of reach, honestly, if we can be honest, out of reach for a lot of us who are running community theater groups or doing it at the middle school, high school, elementary school level. That's not even a choice, really. It's like now you have the ability to do that, but then you can upgrade. So now you can go, okay, well, we sewed together some bed sheets on the first one, and it looked good, but now, like, we've done it for three or four shows, and this is really cool because all we have to do each time is get the new images. So let's, like, maybe sink a little bit of money into a new psych, or maybe we'll sink a little bit of money into, like, they make projected, like, projectable surfaces. And you can go to your Roscoe's, or you can go to, like, all of your different, tip and we'll put some resources up about that, too all of your typical like theater vendors that you would use and buy, buy stuff that's very specific to projection. And that looks beautiful too because then those materials are made to like grab the image and make them as bright as possible. But you don't have to do it the first time out. You can start here and then you can kind of work your way up to that. So yes, and coming full circle. Um, Robert was the big fan of this image. We love Billy Elliot. We love the, um, the dreaming big and the possibilities. And we've spoken a lot to that, but I really want to take a little bit of time for you guys. What time, what time is it? What time are we running up against here? Is it one? Oh, wow. That was an express class right there. Yeah, seriously. Um, but I know it's getting late in the day, too, and it's like, gosh, we've been here for a few hours. And those of you who have hung in with us online, we really appreciate that, too. Um, but um, I wanted to have a little bit of time here where you guys can fire some questions at us. We're going to have Julie in the back like fire some questions at us too. We've had some email questions. We've had some questions come in online as we've been kind of going through. So she might fire some questions in, but um, it can be centered around projections, but don't feel restrained to that either. It can be anything that we've talked about today. Um, I think that some of the meat could come out during this time too, like as you guys see connections to the things that you're doing. So, And we've got Robert Donahueing is up again. Does literally anybody know who Phil Donahue is? Okay, <laughs> I'm just making sure. 
Yeah, I'll be happy to. Uh, one question, uh, real quick, that did come in through several emails was, can I get a copy of this pr uh, presentation, the workshop? So yes, if you're not already following um, Theater Avenue on YouTube, on Facebook, I think, yeah. and t Twitter, Instagram, everything. It's because it's super trendy and cool. But no, uh, the YouTube channel, um, this is actually being cast on YouTube Live. And so the video of this is available. And then they'll, um, so if you have any other questions about some of what was said, or if you're like, I want to go back and see that thing again, or what was that video called? Or they said, what were the five things that Amanda talked about were her, you know, the rules of the game, or the standards? Like, there's ways to see it. So yes, you can check out the YouTube page. I'm not a note taker personally. So I think it's nice to have, be able to double back on some of that stuff. Um, and you guys are part of year one. This is the first time we're doing this theater workshop, which I, th I feel like we'll, we'll do it again. Uh, maybe it'll be different topics or things that we do. But yes, yes, there will be outreach about that. So I don't know, any questions in the room or any questions kind of coming in online? And we will all be available to answer. Do you guys want to come stand up and we can all sort of... We have a date at the Performing Arts Center, and they have very nice facilities, and there is a site. They have what they call a business projection screen, where it's basically that. It comes downstage, and any front lights that are added to it washes it out. It, it's not even behind the kids. You know, it would be like in front, so that's not what we'd use. But, I mean, we have the site that we'll have. We can put lights on it. Um, but I don't think there's anything. So you would do put a projector either up or behind the psych, it's so far back, would it mm -hmm. still look okay? Yeah, and it's sometimes it's hard to know. Did you want to speak to that? No. Oh, you jumped, you jumped for the mic, no, I thought, oh, Robert knows exactly what to do. No. Sometimes it is hard, like, I don't want to guess at it, too, yeah. because, like, without exactly seeing the space, you know? Which one thing I will tell you, and this is not a fair and complete answer to your question, but one thing I will say is that um, as long as you can like bypass a little bit of the salesiness of it, like having a professional vendor, if you're really looking at renting or buying a projector, I mean, it literally is like Epson.com, who's close to me, like have them come visit your space. Because whether you're considering renting or especially buying, it's like they can sort of help guide you or outfit if it's something that you think you would use again. But I, th I, I feel like maybe from your question, you're thinking about like, what is the makeshift way that we can kind of work around yeah. what it's we've a got? It's really nice theater, but it doesn't have yeah. that yet. Yeah. So we're not yeah. dealing with like, we have to do it in the band room, but <laughs> it is on a stage. Which is nice. Yeah, but I just don't, I don't know how. We've been our own way to do it. Yeah. On the psych, I guess. Unless we're yeah. going to make it another depends. screen and bring it further downstage. And, and this is just, uh, like I said, makeshift is the, my middle name. Because uh, all the spaces we've done stuff in, sometimes you just makeshift. In some cases, the projector is set to hit the drop-down screen. In some cases, if you raise the drop-down screen, you can actually keystone it to hit the psych. It depends on your space, but it's worth playing around with to see if you can still utilize the projector that's already mounted. Mm -hmm. um, that's always my first choice. If there's no way to do that, then rear projection is my favorite. Um, again, it depends on how much space you have between your back wall and your cyclorama, but if you even have if you even have a few feet back there, utilizing mirrors or whatever can help you get a, a picture you can work with on your cyclorama. And, and that is back at the back of the stage, but again, it, it scrim is a black curtain. Got it. So you can't really. Yeah, yeah. It just depends. And 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 like he was talking about, construction plastic is my friend. If if I have a parent or somebody who's willing to build me a frame, I can float something forward, and then you can either rear project from up high or down low, depending on. It just depends. Like one of your themes is play around, play around. This this is our production of Charlotte's Web. We did a while back uh, in Denver. And that's a screen that one of our parents built. That's, again, I gave up eight feet of space. I think 10 in that situation was right in the middle of the stage. So if the stage was only about 30 feet to begin with. It's about 10 feet up. So we built, we built a screen. It was up on a set piece, about halfway up to our stage. But then we had all these beautiful animated spider webs, <laughs> which we couldn't have done the show without because we didn't know how to make Charlotte actually weave spider webs in real life. But the rear projection then became a huge part of our show, so it was worth the, worth the effort to build something to. Yeah, and I mean, 
as far as like the sp specifics to the screen too, it's like once again YouTube videos or just even some resources, tips and techniques like you can use PVC piping in some really powerful ways. Like you can fashion a frame out of that and we've done that before. You know, in this case it was literally like making a, a frame like for a canvas and then just like stretching it around it just like you would a painting canvas. And, um, and the key there just being like once again, like try to get people involved who can help make that stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. So does that help a little? Yeah. Yeah. There are, oh sorry, there are two, I think, tech people that will be there to help with our show and everything. Um, yeah, I did say projection and they said, this is what we have. <laughs> so um, I might could check back with them to see about what's possible. Uh, my technical director, his name is Josh and he's helping run sound right now. He could teach an entire course on this exact thing. Here, oh, this is Josh, everyone online. This is Josh. Josh is, oh, he's ready to go. I just wanted to say one thing, and that is I think sometimes one of the biggest challenges with technical people is getting them to overcome their immediate, like, this is not possible. <laughs> this can't be done. And Amanda and I have learned over the last, I don't know, 10 or 12 years, we've worked together, that I have to stop and listen and then come up with the solution. And the first one isn't always the right one, and we do have to experiment. But sometimes you have to be a little patient with us because we like to explain all the ways that it can't be done first. <laughs> and then maybe if you're patient with us, we can come up with a reason. I've, I've with Mitch, several times over the years, you know, said, this is why it's impossible. Wait a minute, we could. And, you know, even talking about it and letting them explain why it's not possible can actually help get to the point. You're like, actually, I mean, that example that I threw up there, you know, we did. There, a lot of stages have those tiered curtains. And so, you know, I think it had a black wall in the back. And so we just went up to that, like, first curtain, I think, maybe even the second curtain, and built this large structure with a stretched construction plastic screen have literally, this This was the projector, um, short, th it was touching the back wall and shot up, and that was the story you heard earlier about, like, the kids had to walk over it. Some of the kids were, like, walking around their doors, loading doors on either side. The kids are walking around outside during the show just to get around the projector, but we felt like it was worth it um, for, uh, it may have been Annie, it may have been Charlotte's Web in that space we used, but. Yes, that's the thing. Um, I, I have to learn as a director not to be too stuck in a fantasy world <laughs> and let him explain to me physics, um, which helps. But also, the more if you're committed to a vision and making it happen, and you believe it will really serve your vision and your purpose as a director, it's worth it to talk to him. Yeah, and and I would say like kind of like the the skit that you did earlier with um, Amanda talking to the boardroom. Like if w when you're talking to the tech people and able to like express the vision and sometimes it's express the vision I know with tech people sometimes like when I share stuff with them it's not like the artistic vision necessarily of like here's the story I'm telling this and that it's like hey here's a couple of clips I saw of some really cool like technology stuff like here's a few things along these lines I know we're not gonna be able to do this type of thing but I was thinking something like this and I know we're limited, blah, 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 but you're kind of able to stir and inspire their tech self because that's your audience at the time and saying like, and then that goes with this. And it's kind of like working with like a mood board where you're giving somebody like some videos and like a Pinterest board to be like, sort of like this, along these lines, here's a clip of a thing. Is this a real thing? Here's a, a link to a projector. Is that a real thing? I'm not sure. And then you start working together and it works. And I think one other piece about uh, the lighting, uh, it's, it's hilarious to me all the time, but about like how, does, how do you prevent lighting from washing out the thing, the, the projection on the screen? And it's a real thing, and sometimes the answer is like you know, a $2 piece of poster board to cover up some of these halogen lights that we did here in the room because we were like, we want lighting in the room for here, but not here, and we're playing with, bo we're playing with light switches, and we're like, do we unplug light bulbs? Do we, what do we do? We just put up plastic? We were like... And at some point, we're like, let's put a poster board. Like, literally, let's put a poster board to just dim it a little bit. It'll give us a quality. And at some point, there's this, like, balance of, okay, the cost of the poster board and my time to do it. And, like, does it value on the what shows up? And it's like, it's or worth my Will it my start time. a fire? Will it start a fire? Ask that question. Paper will not work over everything. Which, and I'm speaking on behalf of the tech people. And now. that's why plastic was ruled out. They were like, it'll get hot. And we're like, okay, so. But there's something else. So yeah. the tech was like, here's why it won't work. And we were like, 
but could this work? And then we kept going together, and it's goofy, but I mean, at the end, we end up with these couple of things that really made a difference to be able to say, that's what we're looking to do, you know? Yeah. Any other questions, either in the room or Julie? I don't know if there's anybody with questions out there. <laughs> Make sure that people on mic. Hello. Okay. Um, we do have a question that came in over email. As far as like projections, what's the price range? Or like how, how can I fit that in my budget? I think they're wondering what the yeah. general cost of projections is. I can tell you that for us, like what we do with Theater Avenue, I mean, we, we have purposely tried to price our stuff really low because for us the whole idea of leveling the playing field is like making sure that teachers, directors can like put a whole collection together for a few hundred dollars. So our projections start at like $49 then they kind of go up and so like some of our animateds are like 99. I think it probably varies out there but I think that one of the strengths of projection really is the cost effectiveness of it and I think it will always stay that way. I think kind of like the technology as it evolves, you'd think it gets more complicated but actually gets better, faster, cheaper and like more flexible and easy to use. So I think that actually, the, I'm glad that they asked about the cost thing because I think that that is one of the biggest strengths of it is that no longer are you bound to this I want to make the show magical. I want to transport the audience. I want to put them in the jungle or I want to put them like at the seaside or whatever. I only can use something that's like painted or dropped. And that's no longer the case. You can really do that. And do, here's the thing too, do lots of them in a show. I mean, you've got a show like Annie, you're here and you're here and you're here or Susical, and you really want to like give JoJo that full journey. It's like you want to show that. It's like, yeah great to be able to like quickly get, I mean, I think so one teacher was telling me, and I don't know the show that well, Legally Blonde has lots and lots of locations. They're like, I don't even know how I would pull this off except using projections because that would give me the ability to go here and then go here and then go back and all of that, so. If, you are, if you're looking at investing and in getting your projections to work, and you like one show you spend on your projector, this is how we worked. The next show I spend on building a screen, the show after that, then I can afford projections <laughs> or whatever. Like, but that's a great way to utilize your talent in your cast or talent in your pool of people in your school or in your, in your theater because you can project, uh, as long as it's high res and it's beautiful, you can project original art from your young people too for free, child labor laws or whatever. But I'm just saying, like, there's, there's some great ways to save money doing that too and also part of showcasing all the talent that's in your cast. That's a way to do it too. I use Mitch except when he is way too busy building projections for other people, in which case then I tap my young, my young artists that are around me. And, but that can add a whole nother dimension to the show to have original art by the youth up behind them too, so. Anything else? You I, know, I, I think this has been fantastic today. I, I will say this before we go, and I think we have an, even have a slide for this to help you with it. Um, those who are in the room or even people who are online, we do have a survey that we created that we would love for you guys. And we gave it a nice little short URL, even though the first URL that came up was like a mile long. And I'm like, oh, I can't put them through that. So we have a shorter URL. If you were emailed the email reminder, which Robert emailed out like yes. last night and this morning, um, the link should be in there. But if you could take even a minute or two before you go, or if people who are online, I know sometimes the best time to give feedback is like in the moment. Because for me, I go home and I'm like, what did I just watch or see? Um, so it's good to do that. And we would really actually appreciate that because that helps us teach better, share better, and just understand better like the questions that you have and how we can answer those questions or make sure that we can you know, do it a little bit differently next time. I was also going to say too, for those of you that are teachers, if you need like continuing education credits or want some little certificate for being here today, just let me know. And I can make one and send that to you all too. One other piece I would say is that locally, especially you guys are in Sonoya and everyone who's here physically locally, um, but one thing is that Theater Avenue is local here. So if you have questions about stuff, like we could be able to help say, hey, let's help you figure this out. Because I think the one thing you were talking about, it's like the, it's not just that the cost is low, but like we are a group of people who, who want to help tell stories, want to help change the, I, this sounds like lofty, but like change the world and change through kids like expressing themselves and through getting this like the best opportunity they can. And so, gosh, if that means us going, taking a little day trip out to Sonoya 
and calling in sick to work, then so be it. You know, we'll we'll bite the bullet on that. You know, but no, but that's a, a real thing. Like we would we would do that type of thing. That's something with the Avenue to be able to say like, hey, we'll help out. Or for those online, like we'd be happy to do a, a Google Hangout, Google Duo nowadays. By the way, Duo or a FaceTime to say like, hey, show me your space. Let's look at the projector. Let's look at what what do you got. We'll answer as best of questions as we can. Because whatever it takes to help, it's, it's not just like a company to sell. It's more like, gosh, like how can we best help? What tools, what resources, what, how can we connect the communities together with one another? Hey, you know what you're doing? You know, Willy Wonka, I'm not sure all the answers to that. Let me put you in touch with these other people who have done Willy Wonka from me before. They might have some other questions about how to process slides or what they worked, what they found worked and what didn't, you know. So there's a way where it just connects and it could really help even on a personal level. Yeah, you tell us what we what you want and we go make that thing and that's what we love to do. So um, thank you all so much for coming. The people in the room, it's like, yes. wow, yeah. wow. Thank you so much. And everybody online too, thanks for hanging in there with us for four hours of theatrical, what I believe to be magic because I think I laughed probably more than anybody and just enjoyed listening to the stories and listening to you all. But we do want to say farewell and we really appreciate um, everybody connecting with us and we want to stay in touch too. Thank you.